Sun University. Uh, today, we would like to welcome Emmy Hamper Mila Gosa uh, from the uh, Economic Research and Economic Cooperation Department and Asia Development Bank. Today, she will present about the why institutions matter for opposing Asia infrastructure financial gaps. And then, uh, Dr. Dun Yong Pa, Principal Economist of the Same Divisions and the Asian Development Bank, will talk about the overview books about the infrastructure financing in Asia. So we will start with the Dr. Emmy and then Tom will present later. So the floor is to announce. Thank you so much. How do you turn this on? Yeah. It will just turn itself on. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, I'm very happy to be here. Good morning, everybody. And I'm very um, happy to present uh, uh, the book that is uh, Labor of Love. Uh, uh, lots of um, emails, thousands of emails, hundreds of meetings, many sleepless nights for the editors and uh, for the contributors as well. Um, the book is entitled Infrastructure Financing in Asia, and it is edited by our Vice President for Knowledge Management, um, uh, VP Bambang Susantono, with uh, Tom Dong Pyun Park, and Chu Chan, uh, one of our colleagues at the RMR, of the Macroeconomic Division. So my chapter, I'm going to present uh, the contributed chapter from me, it's about um, why institutions matter for closing Asia's infrastructure financing gap. I wrote this with a colleague of mine, Lotus. She is unfortunately flying back to Manila today, so I'm here to present it alone. So basically, what I say in my chapter is that uh, traditionally the public sector finances majority of uh, the infrastructure investments. So uh, it depends on what data you use, but it's between 70 to 92 percent. Now, um, the estimates of Asian Development Bank show that we have to uh, invest more. In fact, 1.7 trillion US dollars more per year until 2030. And uh, basically, the government cannot cover all of this. And what does that mean? That means that private uh, investment in infrastructure should grow. Um, depending again on the estimates, it says up to 60% by 2030. However, as we know, private sector do not invest uh, in infrastructure as much as we would want to. Um, there are many risks that the private sector uh, are um, facing that they don't want to face, so for example, weak property rights, lack of policies, poor governance, and lack of institutional structures. And this is very um, critical because, for example, in Asia, where we need uh, a lot of these uh, infrastructure investments, Asia recorded the highest number of privately funded infrastructure projects which were canceled or under distress. Now, <clears throat> What I'm trying to say in my chapter, chapter two of the book, is that we need to fix the institutions in order to encourage private investment in infrastructure. If we improve the institutions, then the risks will be mitigated, and then the private infrastructure will come back. Uh, the problem is, so many people consider institutions as given. They think the institutions are, are there, it's, it's, you know, it's working properly, but actually most of the time they are not. We need to improve the institutions in order to improve the collaboration between government and private sector. So uh, if you have good institutions, uh, then government and the private sector do tend to collaborate and to cooperate. There, there's trust, basically. And then they don't try to, to work uh, against each other or for their own needs. So the basic framework of uh, chapter two is uh, Williamson's um, Economics of Institutions. Basically, it says that if we look at the society, there are four levels of institutions. The highest level is the social embeddedness level. These are the informal rules of the game. And uh, basically, it covers tradition and religion. It takes a long time before this can be changed. At the second 
second level is the institutional environment. These are the rules that governments make. These are the laws, this is judiciary, bureaucracy. At the third level are the governance and social. So, so if you have the rules, then the people act according to the rules, right? So basically, if the government says that um, you're not supposed to cross this road, people will not cross this road. So this, this is basically a very simple explanation. And then the third is the incentive structure. So incentive structure means if the government says you're not supposed to cross this road, and you cross the road, the, 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 the incentive is you will be paying a fine. So basically, this is the how to explain it. Now, as I said earlier, what they, what many researchers think is that the institutional level, level two, is already okay, but actually it's not okay. Given an example, for example, we do an, uh, ADB does a lot of infrastructure projects and we um, estimate, for example, that um, the benefits, economic benefits from this project is very high. Uh, and therefore, in private investors should actually be very interested in making this bridge. So, but private investors don't come to make the bridge. So even if you say the economics of it is right, at level two, the private investors don't come, then you trace it to level three, it's because they still think there's a risk. So basic premise is we have to fix level three in order to in increase private sector participation. So I'm going to show this using four examples of uh, um, financing methods. So the first example is land value capture. Basically, it's uh, the, when you try to recover the increase in land value or property value by a change in uh, government law of that place. So I'm going to give you um, more example. Usually, uh, to capture the value of the land as a result of regulation impose a tax. This is the most common. And literature said that in order to do that, you have to have two things right at the institutional level, and that is the property rights should be very well in place, and the taxation mechanism should be also in place. Let me give you an example. So this is in uh, Seoul, South Korea. This is the infrastructure zoning. So what happens is if you look at the, the little white circles, these are the stops in the metro line. Of, uh, so uh, stops in the metro line, very well connected in the city. And what they did is they created a, a law that mandates how high or how many people essentially you could build buildings near the nodes. So near the nodes, you see red, it means the floor area ratio. It means the ratio of the floor to the area of the plot is allowed or is only supposed to be high, which means you can only put high buildings near the nodes. The yellow and the green areas show a lower floor area. So you cannot build higher than one story, for example, beyond that. So it shows then what will you do? You will build high buildings, which means you will have offices, you will have commercial, which means the government can tax more because they invested in the rail. So this is this is basically a very simple uh, explanation of, and this is a more detailed look at it, as you can see. So higher buildings at the nodes, where there are more nodes, and lower buildings as you go up. So the government earns money from this, but this can only work if you have proper taxation mechanisms and very strong property rights. So private-public partnerships, these are institutional arrangements where the government works together with private parties to, for infrastructure projects. In many cases, no, let me, let me be correct. In the case of Azerbaijan, because this is what I, I used the presentation last week for, it's not about the money. So government works together with the private sector because the private sector can bring in a lot of these good management practices, efficiency. Not, it's not always about the money. For poorer countries, they need money, of course, but not always about the money. And one of the main important mechanisms that works in private-public partnerships is the transfer of risk. So the risk from one party goes to the other. Now, literature says that for this, to work, you need to have proper PPP policies and 
PPP processing units. It cannot be left to one agency uh, that does a lot of other things to process this. There has to be a specific unit that processes public-private partnerships. Now, let me give you an example. This is the Mactan Cebu International Airport, which was built, Terminal 2, which was built in Cebu in uh, the Philippines. And uh, basically, this is a partnership between the Department of Transportation, the Mactan Cebu Airport Authority, as well as two private financing, large private companies from India and from the Philippines. It costs 17.5 billion pesos, and the cooperation period in which uh, the private sector could earn some money from this is 25 years. So this was built and processed under the PPP Center of the Philippines. They took, and this has been finished, it's operational, and it worked. So PPP, the Philippines has one of the best examples of PPP, but specifically because they have laws governing PPPs and an agency that processes PPPs. Now, green bonds. Um, Tom is uh, much more informed than me on green bonds, but basically, Bonds are issued by public and private sponsors to finance projects and technologies that have environmental benefits. They appeal to ethically and socially responsible investors. There are generally two kinds of bonds, labeled bonds and climate aligned bonds. And labeled bonds are those that have direct impact and climate aligned are those that contribute to better environments. Now, Europe contributes 42% of the green bonds. We still have uh, a lot to do in this area and the rest comes from World Bank, IMF and all of the development banks but there's still a lot of uh, area and a lot of um, funds that could be raised in green bonds. ADB takes green bonds very seriously. We have a framework by which we analyze green bonds and um, we actually launched uh, several other kinds of bonds. We have the blue bonds which is uh, for marine, they are now very conscious about it, and also gender bonds, so projects that have gender, strong gender in that. But it all goes through this framework where we analyze whether they really contribute to the objective. So is it really contributing to the climate and so on. So to attract green bonds, literature says that you have to have a strong sustainability policy, a green policy. The country has to prove that they are very um, concerned about the environment, they have their own policy on how they will move towards mm -hmm. sustainability. And if you have that, green bonds are easier to attract. Okay, institutional investments. Institutional investments are those that are coming from pension funds. These are people who are saving money, they save it in the pension funds, and then the pension funds are like the wealth management funds they manage the money and they invest it. Now, uh, banks and insurance companies account for 42% of institutional investment in Asia. This is a very new uh, source of investments. However, they are very cautious. Ever since the uh, global finance crisis uh, and the Asian finance crisis, they've been very, very cautious about how to invest their money. And so what happened is they are they they are very um, they don't they like modest risk. They are very happy with modest gains, but the risk really need to be put down. And the good news is Asia has the highest savings in the world, so there's a potential to tap to tap this bit. Let me tell you a nice story about the famous Skyway Tunnel. This was funded by 1.7 million people who were saving for their retirement, and it's an overhaul of the sewerage system, the longest overhaul, biggest overhaul in the UK ever since the Victorian times. So they never cleaned up the sewerage system. And this was funded by pension funds of British people. So how did the government manage to reduce the risk? They, they, they did a lot of reforms. First of all, they created a reform that allowed pension funds to merge the funds together to create a big fund and then invest. That's one. They also uh, clarified the yield investors. They, they underwrote yields, which means even if it doesn't earn, for example, they are, you are guaranteed this. The government said we will guarantee you this, you just invest. 
So underwriting by the government is actually not very well known. But it was very controversial, but they did it, and they managed to encourage them to invest. And this project is underway. To attract pension funds and institutional investors, you have to provide guarantees. This is what literature says. OK, so just to wrap everything up, if you want, so this is chapter two, you need to strengthen institutions in order to attract private investors. Don't think institutions are given. It's not, it's not always given. You have to fix that first, and then they will probably come if you also provide proper incentives. So for land value capture, you need strong property rights and efficient taxation. The example was in Korea, where they had this metro system. For public-private partnerships, you have to have dedicated policies and PPP processing units. The example was in Cebu, the airport. For green bonds, you have to have a sustainability policy framework. Framework example was the one that ADB used for green bonds. And for institutional investments, guarantees are the way to go to fix the institutional environment. And the example is the UK. All right. So this is my presentation. This was specific to Azerbaijan, but uh, not relevant. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, very willing to answer them. Thank you. OK, I think we will move to Tom first. Yeah. And after like, we finish presentations, we will okay, uh, have the question and answer session. OK.
this spoke, right? Infrastructure financing in Asia. So uh, well, let me just briefly talk about why uh, we came to do this book, make this book. Uh, of course, as you all know, ADB is primarily an infrastructure and investment bank, right? So, of course, we also have operations in social and other areas, but we are primarily an Have you? I think we can use this sort of ADB is primarily infrastructure bank, although we are trying to uh, diversify right into other other areas such as social uh, infrastructure, social investments, and so forth. So, uh, so we also do have a lot of uh, knowledge works, right? Research work on infrastructure. So, uh, and, and, in, and more specifically, infrastructure financing. But all these uh, research that we did was uh, lying around in a disorganized way. So, our Vice President, uh, uh, Dr. Bambang Susantono, thought it was a good idea, and I think we all agreed to organize these different kind of, uh, all these different research papers and other knowledge works on infrastructure financing lying around different parts of the bank. Let's bring them together, right, and make a book, collective volume, uh, out of out of these uh, our disorganized uh, body of knowledge. Let's organize them into a nice uh, book, and uh, this is the result, right, of that organization of this. Uh, different uh, disorganized uh, uh, body of knowledge works. So I think uh, we all know what Asia must do to sustain its growth as well as improve the quality of its growth. Uh, I think uh, one thing Asia did quite well, uh, some countries did it better than others of course. For example, I think well-known comparison is China, right, has more and better infrastructure than India, right, for example. But anyway, the region as a whole, we did we did invest quite a lot in infrastructure. That was a key reason why Asia grew so rapidly and uh, uh, significantly, substantially outperformed. Right, other parts of the world grew faster than other parts of the world. But of course, that's in the past. Right, going forward, we need to continue to invest a lot in infrastructure, on transportation, on energy on telecommunication and on urban infrastructure such as sanitation, right? We need to continue to the to number one, sustain our growth, but number two also we need to do that in order to improve the quality of our growth, right? In particular we need to in the, for example, we need to invest more in green infrastructure, right? Such as renewable energy so we can uh, move toward more environmentally sustainable right growth paradigm and development so so we need we all know what we need to do we need to continue to invest heavily in infrastructure but the key bottleneck of course is financing because infrastructure is costly isn't it it's not cheap i mean uh, i'll give you some more numbers from the book in a short while but it's a huge amount huge amount of money that we need. So what we want to do, hopefully, in this book is to give uh, all interested parties, policy makers, researchers, or just general readers who are interested in infrastructure and infrastructure financing, what Asia has to do in order to catalyze financing. How do we find the financial resources for infrastructure investment? And of course, uh, I think for one, the one reason this uh, is particularly relevant for, uh, for ADB is, as I said at the outset, we are uh, primarily an infrastructure investment bank. Okay, so, so, so just to give you a broad, broad, very broad overview of the book, a flavor, the general flavor of the book, what is in the book, very broadly, the broad structure, some chapters in this book, right, including the chapter by uh, Amy, which she just uh, presented, 
it uh, examines right the link between infrastructure investment on one hand and our economic growth and that inclusive growth right and development on the other hand right so it's infrastructure investment why it matters for economic growth and development so that's a one set of uh, chapters. Now another set of chapters, which I think is really the core, right? The meat, the beef of this book. They look at the new and innovative financing instruments, right? For for in, for infrastructure. These include the uh, thing again. Uh, Amy already touched upon some of these, but one is uh, capturing spillovers, right? Spillover, positive spillovers from. Uh, infrastructure investment. Another one, or this is a relatively new and underdeveloped in Asia, at least uh, set of intro, in, instrument, infrastructure bonds. I don't know if you've heard about infrastructure bonds. Very much underdeveloped in Asia. We need to do much more to develop these. Of course, green bonds. And then uh, another chapter looks uh, exclusively at the issue of uh, PPP and the role of governance. I mean, Amy also touched on this, but that chapter also does this. Uh, in some detail is the role of uh, good institutions in effective PPP, okay? So there are a number of other chapters. One chapter looks at smart electricity grids, as well as how to finance smart electricity grids. The link between infrastructure investment and human capital. In other words, what is the impact of infrastructure investment on human capital accumulation? Another one looks at Local currency bond markets in ASEAN plus three. Me and uh, the other uh, co-editor, Dr. Shu, my colleague Shu Tian, we are heavily involved in this, by the way, in the, this uh, research on local ASEAN plus three local currency bond markets. And then another chapter looks at the a, a sub-region of Asia, uh, South Asia infrastructure financing in India, right, and other South Asian countries. And then overall, I think. Uh, what we hope to achieve in this book is a broad, right, but yet yet quite deep perspective of developing Asia's infrastructure financing challenge and, of course, how we can overcome this challenge. So uh, let me just go over, right, the contents of the book very uh, briefly. And I'm not going to spend too much time on each chapter, right, but uh, just to give you a more uh, detailed flavor, right, about what we need to do. So, the past and future role of infrastructure in Asia's economic growth and economic development, right? I think uh, one thing that comes up quite clearly from this uh, review, right, review of infrastructure investment in the past, right, is that, uh, yes, Asia has, has done quite well in this area, has invested a lot in infrastructure, that is one of the secrets of our, our success, right? Of our remarkable 30 to 40 year run. But at the same time, there's quite a lot of variance, right? As I said earlier, China, right? I mean, it's a well-known example. So that's why I repeat it. China has much uh, more and better infrastructure than India, right? And that is widely uh, cited, right? As one of the reasons China, right? Was able to grow faster than India, right? In the past. But going forward, the challenge remains colossal, huge. I think the numbers that the authors of this chapter generate is, it's a pretty simple but uh, plausible estimation method, right, is between 2016 and 2030, right, during that 1-5, right, 15 year, year period, developing Asia needs to invest each year on average $1.7 trillion, right, in infrastructure if we include climate change related investment, in other words, investment needed to mitigate and adapt to climate change, 1.7 trillion per year for the region as a whole in, the, in this 15 year period. How, uh, even excluding climate related investment, infrastructure investment, we need 1.5 trillion per year. These are huge amounts by any means. There's for some quite a bit of a variation from country to country, but overall we need to invest about 5% of our output, right, or GDP, right, in infrastructure. So again, huge amount, uh, Amy already mentioned, government cannot do this alone, right? So how do we find the financial resources, okay? Secondly, 
I think uh, I, I can skip this, right? Because Amy already uh, uh, explained this chapter. She did very, explain it very well. Number three. So let's move straight to the third chapter. So this looks at the what is the well the growth the, the positive impact of infrastructure on economic growth is crystal clear. What is less clear, right? And the evidence is more mixed is the impact of uh, infrastructure on physical infrastructure and development and which is a broader concept than just growth, right? As well as inequality. I think uh, and the, a concerted effort has to be made, right, to make infrastructure investment benefit the poor, right? Actually, that does not happen automatically, right? There are a number of reasons, uh, a number of ways that infrastructure can be tailored, right, to uh, benefit the poor, right? So it doesn't happen automatically. So the, in other words, the, the link between infrastructure investment and economic growth is much stronger and clearer than the effect of infrastructure investment on inclusive growth, right? And then, uh, and one thing that the that this chapter does propose, right? It, that is something new. That is something different. Is this uh, uh, as a piece of proposal actually for ways to uh, to stimulate infrastructure investment, especially by the private sector? Is this thing called uh, independent infrastructure investment? Platforms, right? In front of, so this is one of the kinds of innovative solutions that we are looking. At. So this would be these platforms would be internet-based, and they would facilitate smooth and seamless exchange of information, right? And this kind of smooth and uh, seamless exchange of information can catalyze the uh, in interest of, of uh, institutional investors, sovereign wealth fund, and uh, these other other uh, big uh, institutions, right? So we can generate greater amount of financial resources. Okay. And then this would help to promote transparency. These platforms would help to promote transparency. They would help to promote better governance. They can help promote uh, and accelerate necessary reforms. And last but not least, they can also help to uh, facilitate uh, better communication right, between central government and uh, regional and provincial governments. right? And then this, uh, this is a, a capturing spillover, right? Positive spillover. In other words, uh, you build a subway line, you build a railroad, right? Of course, around the land, the value of the land around the new subway line, the new railroad, right? or new highway, right? That would all increase, right? Of course, it would be nice if governments can issue bonds, right? And later collect taxes, right, to finance, to, in other words, to get the money back for the bonds. So this is the idea, right? And I think uh, we've done, uh, my director Abdul and some other other colleagues, right, they've done some in-depth study on this uh, land value capture. They, uh, they presented it in uh, in Indonesia, right, and some other places. It was quite well well received, okay? So it's uh, some, of course, that, that might sound, sound like a something oh that's nice 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 in principle but can, can that work so but what they did in their studies to suggest some concrete uh, ways in which that actually is a big problem yeah that can be done so yeah there, there is a lot of uh, debate right over whether that's just a pipe dream but anyway they do suggest some concrete and specific ways in which they can be done uh, uh, that that in that study okay and then this is the number five is this a uh, smart or is it Smart electricity goods, of course, this uh, helps to uh, promote energy efficiency and thereby cleaner, greener environment. So this is a this is a good idea for the environment. This kind of, this kind of technological innovation, but of course, it's very costly. This technological innovation. So how do we fund this? There are some innovative financing methods to catalyze smart electricity grids, such as green bonds, such as crowdfunding, and such as securitization to name just three examples so human cap and here the, the idea is that the infrastructure investment right it can help to promote uh, human capital accumulation I think we all would agree right, that of course uh, there's a need for social safety nets let's not downplay that and some at least a minimum le level of social safety nets but Really, the key to inclusive growth, to reducing inequality, 
to achieving the kind of growth that benefits the broader population rather than a small, rich, well-connected elite, right? That is really education, right? And human capital accumulation. And of course, uh, this, uh, this uh, chapter uh, points out that yes, infrastructure investment can contribute to human capital formation and thereby, and thus, inclusive growth. But again, it does not happen automatically. So the, the infrastructure investment uh, project have to be tailored, right, in a way that benefits the poor. And, and in terms of financing, because this is this is not a, not an area, right? Social infrastructure. This is not an area, right, which is attractive for private investors, right? Let's face it; they're more interested if they're interested in infrastructure at all. It's big, big power plants, right, right, or big big railroads, or big subways, or, or and subway stations, and so forth. So you need a uh, blended finance, right, uh, and other. This is a kind of example of an innovative financing solution, right, to catalyze this kind of uh, this kind of. Uh, investment that benefit the poor, right, through capital market formation. Infrastructure bond markets in Asia. Again, this is a great idea, huh? because uh, you have these bonds, right? You have bonds are, bonds are potentially a, a stable source of long-term financing, right? And infrastructure projects are long-term projects, so why not issue infrastructure bonds? So it's a great idea, but uh, in, in Asia, currently, unfortunately, very much underdeveloped this infrastructure bond market. So what are some things we can do? We can one thing we can do is uh, credit guarantees and thereby issue uh, yeah, improve credit quality, thereby reduce risk, right, for private sector uh, investors. ADB is contributing in that regard. We have a facility uh, actually it's not directly under ADB, it's affiliated with ADP. CGIF. It's uh, called the credit guarantee uh, uh, I forget what it fully stands for, it's CGIF, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we also have this uh, need to harmonize and harmonization and standardization, right, of, of rules and regulation of the regulatory framework, for example, so that uh, our markets, bond markets, especially ASEAN bond markets, which are relatively small and fragmented, so global investors and also domestic investors see them as a one one bond market, right? And that would, uh, because in order for one thing, we ran, to, uh, we ran some simple regression. One thing we found out is uh, scale is needed, right? Scale is needed in order to promote the uh, infrastructure bond market development. Okay, so, and then local currency uh, bond markets, okay? And then, the, and then we, unfortunately, right, we, the, again, project bonds, right? Are not so well developed, project bonds, infrastructure investment, for a specific project, right? Bonds issued for a specific project. These are not so much uh, well developed. Now having said that, I do think it's absolutely important to note that uh, local currency bonds have grown by leaps and bounds, right? In, uh, in, uh, in, the, in ASEAN plus, including ASEAN countries, most importantly. I mean, China, Japan, and uh, Korea, right? These are already quite big markets, but in ASEAN countries also, you have, we have to emphasize really local currency bond market has really grown, grown impressively. So as a whole, ASEAN plus three local currency bond markets, right, are almost the same size as Western European bond market. That's quite an impressive achievement, isn't it? But unfortunately, we are not utilizing this new resource, right, for local, reasonably well-developed local currency bond markets for infrastructure uh, uh, investment projects, right? So we really need to align our local currency bond markets, which are already quite well developed, and tailor them so that we can use them as, as a, a use, we can use them to catalyze infrastructure investment projects. One way to do that is, this, uh, as I said earlier, project bond markets, but they're not well developed as of, uh, as of now. And then the infrastructure financing in South Asia, this is a nice chapter that looks at the issue of infrastructure financing in South Asia. And the one uh, key finding that emerges from this chapter is the need for good governance. Because poor governance, and then, and then uh, this book actually quite clearly states uh, 
corruption, right? Corruption is a big deterrent. Right? It, it, it reduces the effective of pu effectiveness of public investment, right, in infrastructure projects uh, for obvious reasons, right? Some of that money gets stolen or pilfered, right? But at the same time, it also discourages private sector participation, right, in investment uh, projects, infrastructure investment projects. Of course, then we have this green local currency bonds. And I do think uh, uh, there, there is at least a, a lot of progress here in, in Asia because China right now is one of the world's biggest green bond markets, if not the biggest. Of course, there, there are some issues that the uh, Chinese green bond standards, are the, the common uh, criticism is they're watered down. They're not as uh, rigorous or strict, right, as uh, global green bond standards, right, or that, uh, like the green bond principles, right, or climate bond initiative, right, these global standards for green bonds. China's uh, critics say is much weaker. But does that mean uh, this uh, burgeoning, this blossoming, this rapidly expanding Chinese green bond market is, uh, is not so relevant? No, I would argue not just because of this, uh, it's allegedly weaker in terms of uh, its definition and how green they are, in other words, Chinese green bonds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that, take, that takes too much away because the important thing is watered down or not, and I think that their standards will become stronger, right, in the future. Watered down or not, it shows a genuine commitment to, right, an interest in green bonds. So I think it's a very promising development in that, that respect. So just because, uh, just because it is uh, said that, oh, they're, they're green bond, their green bonds are not that green and they're watered down, they're not as strong as global standard. Okay, it's a valid criticism, but let's not completely dismissed, right? This is a very promising development in China because it shows a deep interest, right, in, uh, in uh, green bonds and more generally green finance, which I think is very important. It shows, uh, at a broader level, it shows China's commitment, right, toward a greener, right, more environmentally friendly uh, growth paradigm. Okay, and then lastly, of course, uh, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Min Su Li, he's in uh, the ADP's office in uh, China, in Beijing, or China. you also know Mitsu, right? But anyway, uh, 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 they look at the issue of a PPP, they look at the empirical evidence, how does PPP actually contribute to a country's growth, and what are some things that can be done, right, to amplify or maximize the impact of PPP on a country's growth and development. So they look at the issue in, in some detail. I do think, uh, let me just conclude by noting by noting what I think are uh, really some big overall messages emerging from the book. One is, of course, Asia still faces a huge infrastructure financing gap. We need to find the, we know what we have to do, 1.7 trillion per year, 1.5 trillion per year. It's a, however you think of it, these are huge colossal amount. How do we find the funding? How do we get the money? How do we get the financial resources? But I think, of course, the big picture doesn't change, right? In terms of, uh, uh, yes, the government still has a big role to play, public investment, but more and more of that money will have to come from the private sector. Private sector, of course, cares about two things, right? Risk and return. That doesn't change. That will never change, right? But within the broad framework of maximizing uh, private, uh, the risk-adjusted returns in order to in order to stimulate private investors, private investment, we do think there are some new, right, innovative solutions, such as land value capture, such as infrastructure bonds, such as green bonds, and, uh, and other, other uh, new financing instruments and new financing modalities, right? So finally, uh, I, uh, I do think, uh, uh, I think that, that's about it. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, by the way, uh, yeah. before, just one more thing I do have to publicize this uh, Asia Bond Monitor. So we, we all, this, uh, this is a quarterly, right, flagship report. We have to brief the president on this, but then it's a flagship report uh, that I do with my uh, colleague Grace. And then the, the, the reason I'm showing this is that we do, all, we, 
a lot of our, the research we, that we do here uh, does uh, incorporate the kind of themes I talked about. For example, we couple of a uh, like uh, last uh, earlier this year or last year, we had a nice uh, theme chapter on green bonds, for example, that uh, raised mm -hmm. that. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so yeah. much uh, for uh, Dr. Liu Park and uh, Dr. Liu Mi. So right now the floor is open for the uh, Q&A sessions, please. You know, after having heard of your presentation, it seemed to me that the assumption here is that growth is something desirable, and therefore we want to promote growth through, you know, what is the provision of infrastructure. I wonder if this type of uh, consideration in the very long run aspect is viable or not. Because after all, I believe, and many economists also do so, that there's a limit to growth. You know, when you talk about the development of infrastructure, it implies reallocation of resources and also reallocation of benefit out of uh, this public project. And to me, I find that you mentioned something about the economic equity problem. Growth normally will not go hand in hand with equality because normally infrastructures, good infrastructures, system, are normally found in the big city, in the capital city and so on. And if you take any country as an example, how about the rest of the country? Like in Thailand, you find everything so high quality in Bangkok. But not the rest of the kingdom, you see? And to me, I find that this type of consideration will lead to more severe economic equity problem in the future. Look at the national point of view or globally point of view. It'll be the same. Also, the distribution of benefit out of this in provision of infrastructure, I think it will be in the hand of the few. And even though PPP, if PPP is feasible and possible, I think it will strengthen those financial institutions that will become very influenced, will become very big. And that might lead to the problem like, you know, the subprime problem, or in Korea, shareholders and so on. Because eventually, this financial institution will grow very big and will become very influential and have a dominant role over all the economy. You know, to me, I am now, I am not for growth put it this way. I think growth to me is not sustainable. And if we try to promote growth, <coughs> it means that we have to use more and more resources. Now infrastructure, once are created, the other part of the cost is the maintenance cost. I think that is very important as well. Otherwise, I think uh, the benefit out of the provision of infrastructure will, will be very limited. California now, they say that all infrastructures have obsoleted. They should, you know, build a new one. So I cannot get out of my mind that I believe that small is beautiful, not big is beautiful. If small is beautiful, probably, you know, the paradigm of economic development will be different. If we try to emphasize on growth, eventually we probably have to find new resources out in the outer space, like in other planet, which I think now some countries are doing that, exploring whether there will be resources in other planet that we can exploit. You see, I, I don't know. This is not my, my view. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your comment and some more. I, I should say philosophical and uh, not not directly germane to infrastructure financing, but it's a it's an interesting comment nevertheless. Uh, what I can say to that is, uh, as I said earlier, and as one of the chapter explained and documented in mm -hmm. some detail, the 
link between infrastructure investment, and I, I've done some work on this in the past also, mm -hmm. we find the same result, but anyway, mm -hmm. the link between infrastructure investment and growth is, is, is positive and significant, it's very clear. Mm -hmm. Study after study after study uh, and I find that, right? But uh, at the same time, and, the, and then of course I myself did some study <laughs> And this few years ago, it was a uh, and and then again infrastructure investment and inequality. That link is uh, empirically mixed at best, and more broadly, the link between infrastructure investment and inclusive growth. Inclusive growth is a broader concept than just inequality, right? That's also mixed at best, right? It's not it's not so clear and strong, right, as the relationship between infrastructure and eco narrowly defined economic growth. Now having said that, I think uh, with respect to what you just said, I mean, do we have too much growth? I mean, if infrastructure boosts uh, growth, that's, that's nice and good, but we, maybe we already have too much growth. But I, I, I don't think that's, I would strongly disagree with that with respect to developing Asia. I mean, if, we, if, we, if you look at a country like India or even China, most people are not currently satisfied with their income level. Uh, they, they, I mean, I think it's much more uh, relevant, let's say, for somebody, some, uh, some well-off guy in a well-off country like uh, France or Germany or America or what have you, I think, oh, Oh, well, you don't need any more growth. Of course, for guys in, 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 in that country, I think that, that makes much more sense. But number two, so one thing is, I think, broadly speaking, we do need more growth. I, I do think uh, just because growth, because at the end of the day, you can talk all you want about fiscal policy and transfers and, and, and all these kinds of government health. Of, that's fine, and that's necessary, but at the end of the day, what really lifts people out of poverty is economic growth. And, and, and it's a little busy economy, and then it can be avoided. Right, right, but, but the Chinese miracle, right, I think China's a 30, 40 year run since the market reforms, Deng Xiaoping, 1970, of course, people focus on economic growth, which is, a, of course, if you have to, summarize it in one sentence, it is economic growth, fair enough, but you should not forget literally hundreds of millions of Chinese, right, were lifted above poverty as a result of that nice, that remarkable 30 to 40 year run. Their poverty rate is now like below 5%. I mean, I think that's the real Chinese miracle to me, and that, that's, that miracle was only possible because of this remarkably, ra I mean, rapid, sustained rapid growth, I mean, which I, I think is a miracle, I mean, because a country of 1.4 billion people grow, and each year tens of millions at a minimum are lifted above the poverty line. That's a, and they're, they're uplifted toward more humane and more productive and more decent lives, you know, and that I think is a, is a tremendous, it's not just an economic, narrowly defined economic story, it's a human story, at the, um, it's human uplifting. And secondly, I think infrastructure investment, I mean, this is more anecdotal. Yes, the evidence is ambiguous, but infrastructure investment can contribute, I think, significantly to inclusive growth and reducing inequality. Let me give you an example. One thing, and this is one type of infrastructure investment, I just cannot delete this from my, uh, my, my, my uh, picture of the link between infrastructure and inclusive growth. It's because so many major cities in Asia don't have this, including, including uh, Manila, where I live. Manila, Jakarta, uh, Bangkok is somewhat much, it, not so much, it is much better in that regard, but public transport. You know, like poor people in Manila, poor people in Jakarta, and that even the roads are built for cars, which only relatively few people own. Pedestrians cannot even walk most roads. 
And then these poor people, jeepneys and I don't know what, what, what they would take in Jakarta, but two hours to go to work, two hours to go back home. Huh. I mean, how can infrastructure not be beneficial for inclusive growth, if you think about it? Think what a, I mean, I just, this kind of urban transit, urban public transport, I think to me is just the clearest and crystal clear example of how infrastructure, good infrastructure, public infrastructure can help the poor. Just imagine, I mean, one huge difference between countries like Korea and poorer Asian countries is this public transport, which is disproportionately benefits the poor, it's pro-poor, which they all can go, go with their cars, right? And if there's traffic jam. The other thing I hate to think is yeah. about the role of the government. Right. In implementing yes. the provision of infrastructures. Right. Take the case of Thailand. Right. Hopewell, you can see the case. Right. You know, Hopewell. Right. Now. Yeah. Yes. That was a big project okay. full of corruption. Okay. You see? And such a big project nowadays, the EEC project, several hundred billion baht. Okay. The transportation network. Okay. You know. There are a lot of scandal. So you really need to have good governance. That is another another problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. Any yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, good governance. How can you find? Yeah. Particularly, you know, in, in the third world country. Mm. Fully agree. And, and last but not least, I mean, I think uh, Downplaying growth is a luxury for mm. developing Asia. What's my first point? We, we, we need growth. To, I mean, but, uh, I mean I, do you personally think that growth has a limit? Yeah, growth has a limit, but that, that's maybe for, for the uh, Sweden's and Norway's for the world. It's not for the Thailand's and Indonesia's. Of, I mean, we are we a are long way from that. I mean, uh, we are a long way of thinking, oh, is our income high enough? I mean, we, we, we are not anywhere near that stage of income. But anyway, that's my, my, my belief. Of course, this is just belief. You can say, oh, you can, your own belief might be Thailand's already rich enough. That's fine. I mean, but this is subjective. And I, I think there's a world of difference between the Thailand's and uh, Indonesia's and the Sweden's and Norway's and Germany's and what have you, number one. And number two is, uh, some infrastructure, I have to say, urban public transportation, such as subways, clearly benefits, promotes inclusive growth. If, you're, if you don't know that, if you're not a poor, poor, poor person working in Manila or Jakarta or, or New Delhi or, or one of those cities, two hours to work, two hours to go home, that really kills inclusive growth, I have to say. I mean, just imagine how a good, good, uh, good uh, infrastructure, right, would really promote, right, help the poor. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I have to be passionate about because, because, let me be honest. I believe in this, you know, econometric, you know, study. I mean, used to. I mean, there's all oh, infrastructure and the inequality, infrastructure and inclusive growth link is not, 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 clear, not strong. It's not clear. Mm -hmm. and then, but then, when I notice all these poor workers in cities like Jakarta spending up to half of their day in transport, I thought, oh, this has to be good for inclusive growth. If Jakarta had a good subway system, oh my god, this was hugely promote inclusive. And the third, last but not least, I do think infrastructure itself, not just growth, although you, you mentioned, oh, infrastructure promotes growth, Growth may not necessarily be desirable. I think that's basically what you were saying. And that was your personal belief, which is fine. But it, we all have to admit infrastructure itself can be harmful in some ways, like uh, coal-powered uh, coal, uh, 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 powered power plants, right? It pollutes the environment, obviously, right? But the good, good news is, right, uh, in Asia, generally, and ADP is doing its small part to try to nudge Asia in that direction. But in any case, ADP, I think, I mean, Asia, sorry, is generally moving toward better infrastructure. For example, cleaner, 
infrastructure. So I think uh, I think we have to accelerate that process. We cannot. I mean, the, we are we are going up by like 0.2 degrees right every year. We are we can we cannot be anywhere near complacent. But I do think uh, infrastructure is moving that way, and there are certain things that we can the public se government and private sector can work together to accelerate that process. For example, this uh, smart electricity grids, right? right? And many other kinds of uh, cleaner, greener, better infrastructure. OK. So I, I, I you have some questions? Yes. OK, I'll be first. Okay. Uh, so hello. it's not working. So first of all, like I'm actually from Manila. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. I'm doing my PhD here. So I pretty much resonated with what you said about the disparity on the infrastructure in Manila and Bangkok. And it's really like uh, the presence of trains here is pretty much made um, transportation much easier. But my question is more about financing itself. Because um, since most of Southeast Asia rely on uh, banking for financing, so eventually banks, uh, like infrastructure would eventually lead to being overbanked in terms of financing. So that should show the importance of bond financing. But given the low levels of bond utilization in this part of the world, like how would that be pushed? How would bond financing be pushed? And also, like um, our initiatives, such as like, the ASIN plus 3 multi-currency bond framework, supposed to help that. Because um, from what I understand, like there's it seems to be stagnated, the, the pushing of that. or because like after the Mizuho bond, like, has there been any issuance under that thing? And also, yeah. in terms of uh, impact financing through bonds, like how are they usually priced? That one, I can make this a concept. Thank you. How are they usually priced compared with, say, like you have a bond that, uh, that's tied to a social agenda or to a social to a, to sustainability? Factor compared with another bond, with us, which has the same features like maturity uh, and principle. Like, how are they usually priced? Let me uh, briefly tackle the last question first. Impact investing, right, or ESG investing? This is this has yet to take off the ground in uh, in Asia, unfortunately. So, in terms of pricing, the gap here, if they were if we did have a more developed market, which we don't, would be quite, the gap would be quite large, unfortunately. So, I mean, in other words, uh, investors, right, investor appetite for this kind of bonds or other ESG bonds or other ESG financial assets is severely limited. Right? So, right now we are at this uh, in embryonic, right, market uh, advocacy, market de development stage, and. Not a, well, we, we, we do some research on this. I don't know how much research would help, but uh, my uh, colleagues, my other bond market uh, colleagues in, uh, in, in the research department at ADB, they are more operations type, type guys. Uh, Satoru Yamadera, a uh, Japanese guy, and then he has a Thai, Thai colleague, I mean, colleague, posing through. Well, Bob, Bob this is a, uh, you're not Thai, right? But you're Thai. But Bob is a, uh, his nickname, uh, they are working to promote the investor interest in impact assets or, or, uh, or uh, what is it, uh, ESG, right? The environment, social, and governance, I think, yeah. So, so I think it's a little premature to, uh, to, to talk about the pricing gap or how much the markets value that or price that in, in the Asian context, unfortunately, this day. You're absolutely right. Banks still have a big role to play, right? Because we are still a bank centric. Our the Asia's uh, financial landscape is still bank dominated, bank centric. So of course banks still have a play role to play. But at, at the same time, as I as I pointed out, local currency bond markets have really that is one of the biggest stories, biggest developments, biggest changes since the Asian financial crisis. Asia's financial landscape, but I mean, we do have uh, things, as I say, such as promoting and developing, uh, making sure it becomes more, more more integral part of the financial landscape. Things like 
project bonds, which I have to uh, emphasize to more to strengthen the link between this uh, local currency bond market development and uh, infrastructure investment. Because in principle, in principle, it should be a really good, obvious, natural source of funding, right, for infrastructure investment projects, right? A source of stable, right, bonds, right, long-term term bonds at least does stable source of a long-term financing, but that link is quite weak right now. We have, we have to strengthen that. So that is one of the challenges facing the infrastructure financing challenge. Thanks for the question. Okay, so I have uh, two questions, two questions or three questions for Tom's and another two questions for Emily. So Tom's, uh, I think your book is more on the like a hard infrastructure. Right? But right now, I think uh, all around the world, and including the Asia, they try to move towards like, uh, the innovation, technology innovations about the digital economy, that uh, the hard infrastructure alone is not enough, right? And we need a soft infrastructure. But uh, most of the book is touched on the like, uh, hard infrastructure. So how do you like it? plan or you have any plan to expand uh, into like uh, the development of the soft infrastructure like the education, training, vocational education or how these like uh, financing can come to place like right, uh, for the soft infrastructure. So this is the first question. And the second question for you is about the, uh, you talk about the challenges for the like, uh, Asian economy about the hard infrastructure and you look at the South Asian countries, right? So I would like to know and ask like, for your opinion or like, ask for your comparisons between like, what are the challenges between the like, South Asian country and the Southeast Asian countries like, for the hard infrastructure, how we move forward for this kind of thing. And the third one, everyone know about the Bill and Road initiatives and this one is like uh, the key things for the infrastructure that I got to connect not only in the Asian countries but in the others like uh, area. So I would like to know your opinions about this hard infrastructure that connecting to the Asian Development Bank. How like uh, the Asian Development Bank can play in the Bell and Road initiatives, or like uh, how these like initiatives overlap with the ADB loan, right? This is just like uh, for just can I go for the ME? Okay. Yeah? Okay. For the ME, I think uh, you like uh, propose uh, four key things, right? To move forward for the uh, crossing the financial gaps. Uh, one is the use of land, right? And you talk about the uh, property line, right? So I would like to uh, know for all your opinions a bit because right now we promote, try to promote the Eastern Economic Corridor or EEC and we have the issue of land that uh, we talk about, this kind of thing. So you think that we should provide like the land owner for the foreigners, you know, like 100% owns or like okay, how you should, how we should manage this kind of things, right, to promote the use of uh, land, right? And the second one about the uh, PPP, you say you need a dedicated uh, policy for the PPP to move forward. And you provide the example of the Cebu, right? And you say that a lot of uh, foreigners come to invest for the Cebu uh, International Airport, right? For Thailand also, we have the like a railway and high speed train, right? And we try, uh, tend to invite many countries to come to like uh, in these projects, like the Chinas and others, right? But I'm not sure that, uh, what do you think about the time currency and governance that uh, you talk about? How this kind of thing can be promoted? Right? Can you like, uh, provide some opinion a bit about this kind of things? Right? Please. Perhaps, Tom, go ahead So thank you very much for your question. Let me just very quickly touch upon um, soft infrastructure a little bit. This is Tom's question, but I was in Azerbaijan last week because we launched another book uh, on Azerbaijan. And the suggestion was to plan infrastructure as a set of complementary assets. So you don't just plan a bridge, just to have a bridge connecting A and B, but you actually plan, okay, are the people capable of taking care of this bridge? So you plan education, you plan uh, vocational training. So you have to plan it uh, like that. And indeed, there is a need also for this, not only uh, in uh, more developed, especially in developing countries. You don't only plan 
uh, we need to have a school here, but you also plan who will be the teachers in the school, who will be when the students come to the school, and who will be the the ones who will manage electricity of the school. So all of this soft infrastructure is, is needed. So yesterday we were discussing in um, uh, Asian Institute of Technology about plans for part two of the book. I don't know if Tom will be able to. But those are, some things came up uh, that could be taken as uh, for part of the book. So in terms of property rights, uh, this one is a matter that the government uh, will be able to take. There are some models uh, where uh, they have the right to own, the, the, uh, the right to live, but not the right to sell. So there are the different modalities of this. And of course, this will depend on what the government plans in the future. The land, prop, the um, property values will increase, definitely, when this, when this um, corridor is built. And so it depends on the government what they want to do. If they want to have any commercial, then 100% ownership will not be the way to go. But if they want to have, um, if it's planned for some other purposes, then perhaps uh, that would be uh, an option for them. And finally, for the, um, how to keep, does Thai have a PPP office? It has a PPP office. No PPO. Uh, this is one of the uh, very things. So I did a lot of uh, background research on the PPP, and Africa also wanted to have a lot of investments in uh, from the private sector, and most of them, if not all of them, failed. From what I read, and one of the reasons is they didn't have an independent PPP unit assessing this. And if you want to promote PPP uh, investments, it's really very important. One country in, uh, I think, Guatemala uh, in Latin America, they also uh, wanted to have PPP, but the problem was the PPP unit that they did, uh, that they created, was under the Ministry of Economy, and it was not independent. So they were not recognizing the power of the PPP. So um, to encourage them, I would strongly suggest putting the laws really in order, on creating this independent PPP unit to process all of these things. So for like a, for like a I think this is a project based. It's yeah. a project by project. Yeah. And it's not like an independence. And there is a problem of the building also. Because the yeah. building is not transparent. We have the public private partnership, but the building when the private can like, come to place in the yeah. infrastructure is not clear. I think this is a problem also. Yeah, so yeah. that's at the institutional level. The rule of law, transparency, and accountability exactly. yeah. needs to be improved. And that will take away the, the risk perception of investors also. If they know that the bidding was fair and transparent, then they will come in and also invest. Well, it's true. Well, Temple Initiative is, uh, I think, uh, ADB views it as a positive thing. I mean, I'm not. Uh, qualified to speak for ADB, but I, I don't think there's any reason not to because it's a, a, Asia needs a lot of infrastructure. As you said, BR, BRI is not, not limited to Asia, but in any case, from the Asian perspective, Asia still needs a lot of infrastructure. So the BRI and the AIIB, right? I, I don't know the relationship between the two, but I think these are all positive thing. And with AIIB, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, we are committed to cooperate with, with them going forward. I don't know what, to what extent we are cooperating at the pre present, but uh, as I said, we have huge investment needs. So AI, ADB, AIIB, BR, <laughs> all these put in World Bank, right? They also have a lot of operations in Asia. They would provide only a small share of uh, what is needed in any case. I mean, most of, a lot of the new money will have to come from the private sector, actually, so. so it's but how about your reply about the debt, right? So it tends to create the debt uh, for like, yeah. Like, the yeah. foreign yeah. country. Yeah, I, I'm well oh. aware of that criticism and other criticism, but those in my view tend to be exaggerated, number one. No, first of all, you have to realize Nobody is forcing these countries, right, to borrow. And then this, this uh, notion that, oh, China, they're going to take, uh, take a big asset if you don't repay, right? That, that according to some 
World Bank or some other uh, uh, highly respected institution study is a uh, way exaggerated. That only happened once out of a uh, 500 or, what, or whatever number of a BRI related projects in, in some, I forgot the name, but some port in Sri Lanka, right? It only happened once. So that, that fear or concern is uh, wildly, in my view, exaggerated. Now having said that, the good thing is BRI is, seems to be scaling back a little, seems to be consolidating and reviewing. But I do think it's primarily a an economic initiative rather than this uh, geopolitical uh, initiative, right? The portrayed by the Western media. So, so I do. And on top of that, last but not least, I do think. Uh, I mean, I uh, I made this point at a private sector conference in uh, Singapore last Friday. But I do think this uh, U.S.-China trade conflict, in a way, uh, is helpful because it will, uh, it, was, it is encouraging, I'm not going to say force, but encouraging China, right, to look to the rest of the world, right, rather than U.S. Uh, as a new partners. And of course, in order to be able to do that, you have to become a better uh, global citizen, right? So I do think it will uh, help to further reduce transparency and other concerns that, uh, that have been pointed out although in my view, exaggerated by Western media. Okay, so I think uh, it's moving in the right direction. Okay, so the scale back though, rightfully so. Secondly, the soft infrastructure. Uh, when I led the ADO theme chapter on fiscal policy a few years ago, we talked about private investment in schools, hospital, this kind of social infrastructure, right? education, healthcare, and so forth. And I think the big, the big uh, benefit I think was pointed out earlier by Amy. I think was a, uh, it's a uh, efficiency, better management, right? Because public schools, many of them, right? We, we, I mean, I think we can all agree, right? For in many countries, I, probably in Thailand as well, but in many countries, upper middle income parents, right? Just don't send their children to public schools. <laughs> It's a litmus test of your love for your children, right? Whether you send him or to public school or private school. It's that bad. That's the point, right? And a lot of that has to do with mismanagement, right? Gross mismanagement. So I think, uh, again, there is a scope for PPP and more generally greater private involvement, pri private, private sector role in public, uh, in, uh, in these kinds of social infrastructure or more specifically, education and uh, health healthcare. I think that that's fair to say. So I think the kind of PPP framework we talked about in a couple of the book's chapters, I think uh, uh, perhaps uh, something for future research is to how to how to uh, uh, modify that for social infrastructures. Because at the end of the day, if you want private sector guys in. And this is not just huge investment. Africa, right? Because the, their public schools are even worse. I mean, teachers come to class once a month, right? He, he or she still gets paid. It's that atrocious. I mean, who, who, who loses from that? It's the poor people, poor African children, these kinds of gross government, public sector. Disgusting, I have to say. Public, private sector steps in. Like the slums of Nairobi, Kenya, they have one dollar a month in private schools. You follow what I'm saying? So it's not this. This is not just big time money, huge money. So I think there's plenty of scope for that. And then finally, the question was about digital, right? Uh, technological innovation, right? I think here you're absolutely right. We don't when we say infrastructure, we mean hard infrastructure primarily. But even there, there's plenty of scope for ADB and other multi-level developments to make a contribution primarily by in helping uh, investing in and also catal catalyzing uh, other state, other investors of investment in telecom infrastructure, for example. Of course, of course, I, I do, I, I, I get it. I understand it's not necessarily hard, but there is a hard component involved. It's called 
good telecom infrastructure, good ICT infrastructure that requires a lot of uh, bandwidth, right? A lot, a lot, a lot of hard investment to make that kind of soft, soft uh, transaction, soft activity work. Okay, other questions? Other concerns? Okay, if no, like, I would like to thank like, Dr. Nguyen Park and Dr. Amy from the National Development Banks. So we have a small gift to uh, provide a word of use like, from the Faculty of Economic Commerce and University. Yeah. So we also have gifts. Change. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. 